So, um, lock the door. Uh, everyone's not here. Has uh, lost his chance, I guess. Okay. Uh, oopsless operation. That's that's a brilliant title, right? That's it's so catchy. Nobody knows what it actually means. I love that. That's that's the titles that make people read the abstract. Like, what, what the fuck is he actually talking about? Okay. Anyway, so let's dive right in. Um, software development today. Who's writing stuff with microservices? Who's planning to do microservices? Nobody. You guys, the rest stays at Monolith and like the old crappy stuff that nobody wants to work on. Oh, you poor people. You should, definitely should fix that. Anyway, okay, continuous integration. Come on. At least the person that, uh, thank you. At least the person that does microservice because that's important. Um, the last one, I, I, I think, with only two hands up, that's probably a little bit too, too much to ask of, right? Like, Continuous deployment, anyone? Oh, you do. How, how, much, how many deployments per day? But you actually deploy per day. Don't, don't tell me uh, every three weeks is continuous deployment. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, but, OK. So OK, so you're, you're not committing something. It goes through the pipeline. And if it works, you just deploy it. OK, so you're, you're deploying manually, but on a constant basis. OK, not, not in a three-month release cycle. Good. So why am I asking that? Um, I'm, I'm, well, Christoph, um, I mean, we're in an Asian country that most doesn't, mostly doesn't work. It's the same for Japan. Christoph is a word that's like, nah. I, I, same goes for the yes, to be honest. Nobody gets Christoph right. It's like Christopher, it's like all those different weird things. Like, no, I'm, I'm Chris. That's all right, Chris. And don't even try to pronounce the last name, some, something that the yes people also get wrong. So whatever, it's Chris. Um, if, you, if you ask me something, just, just call me Chris, right? Um, I'm senior developer advocate with Instana uh, for about a year and a half by now. There you go. <laughs> and I'm doing Java for way too many years. I stopped counting somewhere at 10 plus years because that's 10, 10 years is like the line where, where it starts to feel old, right? 10 years, uh, I think somebody earlier said uh, since Java 1.3 is like, uh, I don't even want to know the year when that was around. I was like, nah. Right? And I'm doing a lot of Go and Kotlin and, and stuff like that in the last couple of years, which is also kind of funny um, coming from the Java world going to, to Go, for example. Um, when, when it comes to the JVM, I'm mostly interested in all kinds related to performance, garbage collection, optimization, everything that where the normal Java developers are like, no, 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 no. Garbage collection is for free, right? I don't want to think about that. Go, go away, go away. Right? So that's, peop that's normally the time when people call me or some, some of my colleagues are like, hey, can you actually help us? Something's going on with the application. We get out of memory stuff. Right, those weird things, and then my last favorite one is benchmark fair tales. Any idea what that means? No. Who believes Nvidia is faster than uh, ATI uh, AMD? Sorry. Who believes AMD is faster than Nvidia? Who believes that it only depends on how you actually built your benchmark? Right. So don't believe benchmarks you, you didn't do yourself, and be honest about yourself. Right. So, but because, well, you, you've seen this like nice tie. That was my wedding photo. Um, that's probably the only time in my life where I actually looked like that. So I thought, well, I actually have to look a little bit more on the technical side of myself. So that is me, right? Well, I mean, every one of us is a master builder, obviously. I mean, at least we're trying to. So there's a couple of languages that I really like. Um, there is a, a language which I kind of like. It's, it's a good language from, from the concepts. The syntax is shit, but that's a different story. There is a couple of things that I really hate, right? Uh, especially the Python thing. I always say there's three bad P's. It's PHP, Python, and Perl. No PHP, Perl, Python developers, hopefully. Um, and because I'm German, well, obviously, right? Um, that's the most technical fact about me. Obviously, love beer. Uh, we were just talking about it. So going on to the real topic. Resiliency. What does resiliency actually mean? And you Google it, and it's like, oh, 
178 million results. So somebody has to be right about that, right? And I found this like very interesting tag or, or line, a tag line, which came up right at the top of Google itself. Very nice. It's the capacity to recover quickly from difficult difficulties, toughness. I like the semicolon toughness. That's like beautiful, right? So the resiliency is the cap capacity or the capability to quickly recover from failures, from any kind of problem. So that's what we're trying to do, especially when we're going from microservice environments because something is going to fail all the time. So to actually build microservice applications or microservice infrastructures today, we have a lot of frameworks, which is nice. Uh, it's like a big jigsaw. We're just taking puzzle pieces here and there, and we plug them together. It's like beautiful, right? We've seen this this morning with with uh, Josh. Five minutes, and you have your microservice. Spring Boot, perfect. So how do we make it resilient? Well, that's where it becomes a little bit more complicated, right? Um, but there, there's a couple of more factors to that. Um, these days, we're not writing Java code. We're not writing Kotlin code. We're not just writing Go code. As I said, I'm, I'm at least writing at least four, five, six different programming languages. Who's writing more than one programming language? Who has more than one programming language in production? Not the same people. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> but the, 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 the point is, um, try to choose the right tool for the right job. And not every programming language is as good for, for a different task as the one before, right? As I said, I don't like Python, but Python is really big in the machine learning industry for, well, all the good reasons, I guess. I don't know what those are, but they're probably around, right? Um, well, there's Scala. I don't know what that is good for, but there's probably a reason for that, too. Um, there was definitely a reason in the past for PHP. Um, Hopefully, there isn't any more, but Go, right? Go, if you write microservices. Go is a brilliant language if your microservice is not more than two or three files. Um, Ruby, Kotlin, there is so much stuff. There's even .NET. Uh, I know in, J in Japan, .NET is like super big and Windows servers. Please tell me it's not the same thing here. Nobody uses .NET, right? No? No? Ah. <sighs> Oh, I was I was super shocked when I heard how big .NET and and Windows servers are in Japan. Like, what? Why would you do that? Anyway, um, same thing. Databases. Who's using more than well? Well, ten years ago, for the people that are as old as me, uh, who used something else than a relational database ten years ago? It's probably nobody. Uh, these days, who's using more than a relational database? Today, nobody. You're all using just relation databases? No, you're obviously not, right? A lot of people using Cassandra, which is a column store, or um, some kind of key value store, or something like that. It's the same thing. The relational database is not always the best tool. It's, it's a great tool if you have financial data, if you have financial transactions. Please, please stay with any kind of relational database. And probably not Oracle, IBM, or whatever. There's Postgres. Postgres is amazing, just saying. Um, but same thing, right? Choose the right tool for the right job. Um, and the third thing that changes uh, for the last, I don't know, five, six years is how we actually deploy applications. Even if you're still on the monolith path, there's a lot of companies that go ahead and say, OK, we use at least Puppet, Chef, Ansible, uh, Kubernetes, whatever, to actually deploy our, our, um, our monolith. And if you're going from microservices I mean, it's obvious, right? You can't deploy a, micro a microservice on a dedicated host. Well, you can. Cool. <laughs> right? There's people doing that, but uh, leave those people out of the picture. And ev especially for microservices, everything is great, right? We have this like super distributed system, a lot of different gears, and everyone's work hand in hand. And in English, you would say it's a well oiled machine until it's not, right? So, you if you ha and, and I think somebody was talking about this earlier, if you have like this highly interconnected system um, of microservices, you always end up having some hard dependency on a lot of different things, right? For example, that could be a user service. Every time you have to lock in a user, every time you have to do rate limiting, 
you have to go to the user service one way or another. If that thing fails, well, good luck, right? So it's, it's not as easy to build like a full resilient system. Um, the, the, the reason for the talk is I'm not teaching you how to do that because we're only having like, I think, five hours, right? Something like that. Uh, five hours is definitely not enough to, to teach you how to do that. But what I want to do is give you some ideas, some, some context on where to look, uh, what to figure out. In the end, there's a couple of, of interesting blog post links uh, that you can read up on that. So um, when we're talking about resiliency, we always have to define what we want to be resilient to. And I found some amazing examples from my last career, like a couple of weeks ago, like power outage. I think that was actually San Francisco. It's beautiful, right? San Francisco at night, no lights. That's probably the best picture of it. Well, there's a couple of lights, uh, cars. That's it. Um, hardware failure. That's a beautiful one, right? Uh, however you do that, but that's beautiful. It's a, it's, it's a piece of art, <laughs> isn't it? Right, but power outage, hardware failure. What else? Network failures. What could go possibly go wrong, right? I mean, that's brilliant. That's about what my, my basement looks like, uh, just a little bit less organized. Um, human error. And who can guess what is all wrong about that? There's so much wrong in this picture. I would actually zoom in, but I can't. So first of all, it's closed on both sides. So why would you even do that? Then it's only going halfway through. Why would you do that? Here is a strap holding those two together. Like, why would you do that? Uh, it's like beautiful. And well, uh, yeah, whatever, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> human error. Uh, nobody, that, that never happened to me completely new, right? And the last thing, software bugs. It worked on my machine. Why wouldn't it work in production? The interesting thing is, uh, thanks to Docker and containerization and the possibility to actually run software almost the way you actually put it into production on your local machine is amazing because you're actually getting rid of a lot of problems. Or let's say you're facing the problems a little bit earlier. Beautiful. Now I can't say it works on my machine because it just doesn't work on my machine either. So yes, um, getting rid of my best answer to any kind of problem. So um, what could possibly go wrong, right? There's so many different ways of software failing, of hardware failing, of, of whatever you want to say, right? There's a lot of ways on how your system could completely disappear from one second to the other. And I mean, if we, if we think back on the power outage, uh, you might remember this famous outage of a whole AWS region. I think it was two years ago. Like, when I read about that, I was like, what? AWS region? Gone? How can that happen? Like, uh, my, my whole picture of how an AWS data center is laid out completely changed from one second to the other. Like, what? How can that even happen, right? So what I came up with, um, is a couple of, well, I call them stages of resiliency. So that's my idea of how to make a system resilient. And I'm not an expert in the field. Uh, it's just all like my own personal experience from all the pain that I suffered in the last co co couple of years. Um, so from my perspective, one of the biggest parts of it is it's a cross-cutting concern. Cross-cutting concern means it goes through all the layers. I have three as an example. Um, that's me when I try to write code. You remember master coder, right? Uh, master builder, builder, that's the term. Master builder. Um, that's our uh, DevOps team uh, when they have to deploy something that I built. Um, and that is the people at AWS, at Google, they're like, yes, for everything works for us. Who cares, right? We're not, we're not at fault here. Uh, but there's one layer completely missing. And I actually didn't put a picture because I don't like suits. Um, but if you don't get your management in, 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 in charge with the same vision, like building a resilient system, that will take a lot of man hours, a lot of iterations. So management has to be on board with that. If they're not, it's a big issue. And you can basically just give up right now. So some basic rules. 
and we all have rules, right? We just follow them and everything is good. So, well, let's say it's probably not rules, it's ideas, possibilities, stuff like that. So, no, wrong. That's, that's a rule. That's a rule. That's a hard rule. No, no questions asked, that's a hard rule. Automate all the things, right? If, when people ask me, like, how deep should we actually automate stuff? I always answer, if you do things twice, you have to automate it. Because things that have to be done twice come back at some point. And if they come back two months later, you're like, how did I do that? Well, for, for me, this is more like two days. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm getting old, right? Um, but in general, everything that you have to do a few times, there is a high possibility it will come back to you. And if, if it's you that has to solve the task again, that's great. If you are in vacation and somebody else has to do that, now we got a problem, right? There you go. No, so seriously, automate all the things. Um, I'm running a small startup next to Instana. Um, and for us, I can literally, with a single command line uh, command, I can spin up a whole new system. That's the way we, uh, we automated stuff. It takes a backup, it replaces a backup into a database, it spins up all the services, it, it configures the Kubernetes cluster, all that kind of stuff. Um, not saying you have to go down to that level. For, for us, it's, I'm the only real engineer right now. Uh, we're just four people. Um, but it's important that when I'm in vacation and I'm in beautiful Japan, in beautiful Taiwan, in beautiful Malaysia, I don't know, something like that, I don't want to be called. Hey, our system is offline. I want them, hey, here is a command line. Read it from the wiki, copy it, put it on a command line and go. Right? That's the level that I love. The second point, and well, as I said, that's probably a rule. That's more like you should do that. It's more like a requirement in, in the sense of, yes, if you want to go deep, uh, don't do a single point of failure. And I'm not sure, do you guys know this movie or are, am I really that old? I had this last time. Adrian, come on, help me, please. What's that movie? Ah, oh, come on. No. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just old. I get this. That's the Gr Grim uh, Gris Griswold Family Christmas. So what, what he's trying to do is putting a lot of, of lambs for Christmas on his house. And everything is on this single power socket. Right? And like, nothing works. And she's just plucking stuff in and out. And I'm like, great. Uh, that's exactly how you do stuff. And the third rule is, and I think that is the most important stuff, it, embrace the failure. You have to understand you can't build a system. Wait for, the, wait, wait for it. Wait, don't take a picture yet. Put it on video recording because you will laugh. Put it on video. Don't take a picture yet. Um, embrace the failure. And the, because it's important to understand you can't build a system that just works. It's not going to happen. The more microservice, the more distributed you go, the more will fail. I mean, we're adding a lot of more layers, right? We're adding network communication between every single call. We're adding all this good stuff. But if you embrace that something can go wrong, you can literally do everything. Now you can record and wait for it. And I have some water in between. No questions asked, right? <laughs> I hope this is not in Taiwan. It's probably not. Malaysia? <laughs> anyway, for rule number four, and that's a hard rule again, have a beer whenever everything works, and be fast, be quick. Because as I said, something will happen, and you have no idea how long this works, right? So be quick, have a beer, but and like, go fast. And I love the Lego beer. You, you figure out, I'm a big Lego fan, right? Okay, so uh, who remembers this famous quote? And I don't have a video of that. But it was, anyone? Microsoft is with Steve Ballmer. I could actually do that, but I'm not as sweaty, so it wouldn't have the same effect. So as you remember the stages of, of um, Resiliency, the first level is developers. And I think we're all developers here, right? Ah, good. Whew. 
OK, so I'm, I'm speaking to my kind. Good. Well, so developers are actually the first kind of people that, actually, that, that have to think about resiliency. Right after you convinced management that it is a good idea to have a system that actually is just running. Right? So um, as developers, there's a couple of things where we, that we can do. Who knows what that is? That's a circuit breaker. I'm not sure what they look in in Taiwan, but that's at least a European and I think even an American model as a circuit breaker. So that actually does something. It, it breaks the circuit whenever something happens, right? You're, you're putting your fan into water. You think that your, your computer needs to be cooled by ice water, stuff like that, right? Um, it will actually cut the power line. But the same concept goes for services. So it's also called the circuit breaker pattern, which means that if you're trying to call something and you get an error back or something happens, you can't even connect to something because you get an HTTP timeout, at some point it will decide, okay, I need to cut to here and say, it's not gonna work, right? So before you actually try to do more connections to, this, uh, to the remote system, it will tell you, okay, it's not gonna work. Uh, you, you don't even have to try. And there is a couple of ways on how you could actually do that. And one of the beauty things is that you can, ch well, depending on the circuit breaker framework, you can actually chain them together. So you could do things like that, right? You have backend one, you have a circuit breaker. And in this case, you should actually put time budgets. So you could, should say, OK, I'm trying to reach backend one for 100 milliseconds. If it doesn't work, stop here, right? Then you try to reach backend two, which is probably a different AWS region, whatever it is. You give it another 100 milliseconds, and like, well, still doesn't work. So AWS is offline, yay, right? And then you're like, OK, my time budget is 250 milliseconds. I have to respond to the user in 250 milliseconds. I already spent 200. I'm not trying anything else. So I have to give him some failure response. And for the failure response, it's important to be precise, not just sending back an error 500. Don't just send back unknown error. Please try again later. That's annoying. Who had this experience in the past? Anyone? You tried something and it told you, oh, unknown error, 500? Windows is famous for that, right? It does, don't tell you 500. It tells you some weird hexadecimal number. And you have like, what? 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 You put it into Google and you're still not uh, even, what? It, it just confuses me even more. Because now Google comes up with 20, uh, 20 explanations for the same error code. Like, huh? So be precise. Like, hey, our user service is not reachable right now. Um, it's the central part of our whole application. So we're pretty much fucked right, right away. And people told me, don't say fuck, but whatever, right? I'm me. <laughs> so um, our user service is not available right now. Uh, we're sorry. Uh, please try again in five minutes, something like that. Something that actually means something to the user, something that the user can understand and act on. If you just tell him, oh, try again, he'll try again right away. Don't do that. It's, it's not meaningful. As I said, time budget and circuit breakers go hand in hand. It's beautiful, especially because normally your time, HTTP timeout is, I don't know, five seconds. Why would you wait five seconds just to understand, oh, it's not going to work, right? So backend one could be a database. Backend two could be a cache. Right? And only if both is not available, well, then I'm really in a bad situation. Right? I might not get the, the, the last username because the user just changed it, but who cares? In the worst case, the user is trying to change his username again. Well, whatever. Um, the third thing, and I wonder who heard of back-off algorithms or exponential back-off? Two, OK. I, I, I expected it for you, Adrian. That's good. Whew. So back of algorithms, I'm pretty sure everyone's, so who implemented uh, a client for REST API at some point in his life? That's at least a few people more. Have you ever heard of rate limiting? Like you have a budget of 1,000 calls per hour, something like that. That's some kind of a back of algorithm. It's not essentially exponential back of, but it's the same kind of idea. You're trying to limit the load on a server. So for exponential backoff, the idea is a little bit different. And you can see that's Japan. I think it's actually Shibuya. Um, so the way it works is you're trying to call another service. And the service says, oh, 
wait, 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 I'm completely overloaded right now. And it gives you back, hey, try again in 10 seconds. So you're waiting 10 seconds, call it again, and it's like, oh, sorry, I'm still not like 100% sure I could handle overload yet. Come back in 15 seconds. So you're waiting another 15 seconds, and the time increases, which is, is uh, essentially limits the load to the server because now you're uh, you're you're slowing down the actual producer trying to push more and more information on you. It doesn't always work because we can't just always um, slow down producers or receivers or whatever, but we should definitely do that whenever we can. And a, re uh, a REST API, as I said, is, is a pretty good example for that um, because I can tell the user that tries to use my REST API, hey, please come back in. Um, for, for REST APIs, it's a little bit more uh, of a precaution than of than a, um, a direct reaction to a load. But I've also seen REST APIs that do this for, for load purpose. And like, oh, please come back in, like, whatever. They give you some HTTP response header telling you some time in, in seconds most of the time. The other thing is, um, we're, we're developers, so I hope everyone knows the term immutability. Yes, perfect. So we don't need to talk about right. <laughs> Now, immutability, it's, it's super important. And I guess most of us are Java developers. So you know that immutability for the JVM is amazing. The JVM loves immutability, creating, creating millions and millions and millions of objects. Beautiful. Closure people could actually tell you, oh, it's not an issue. We're doing that. We're doing it all the time. In Closure, everything is immutable. You can't create immutable objects. So the way it works is if you look into immutability, um, as long as your object, and I'm sorry for the weird term, doesn't escape the function, the JVM or the JIT compiler is free to say, okay, I don't need this object. Um, I make it easier for you, but I can actually do stack allocation. I know I need X and Y, and both are in, so I just put them on the stack and, and, and simulate an object for you. Um, and that's beautiful because it means the garbage collector doesn't have to do anything, right? Um, with value objects, whenever we get them, I'm um, still hoping for a near future, um, value objects will make immutability amazing because they inherently have this idea of stack allocation and stuff like that built in. So whenever we get um, the, the Val Valhalla, I think it's Project Valhalla, um, the value objects, that will be amazing and it will change Java forever, I hope. Like, Every new feature that's coming, obviously, right? Um, uh, I then put, I, I hate to pronounce that in English. Um, help me out. I, <laughs> I, I think it's idempotency, but uh, it's, it's like a super weird pronunciation. A super weird word, and the explanation doesn't make things better. So, what it basically means is, create retriable or re-executable operations. So the, the idea is you have a transaction coming in and there is something happening in between and before you actually put it onto this in between, whatever it is, you give it some unique number. In this case, one, two, whatever it could be. So you give it some kind of a transaction ID and then you just send it out and like, okay, it gets transmitted here and it fails. Was it written to the database? Was it not written yet? I don't know. Was it maybe half written? Whatever half written means. I heard there is something like half written, like it's, it's like half light and half dark. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, because we have um, a transaction ID, we can say, hey, no problem. I just gonna retry that. I'm sending it over again. And if it's in the database, that's all right. Uh, I can use insert or uh, insert or update and say, hey, if, if that is already written to the database, just ignore it or update it or whatever, right? The, the idea is that the same transaction ID will always have the same result. Again, it doesn't work all the time. Um, obviously, you could use that in a bank and, and pre-calculate the credit that is after subtraction. And then you retry, and in between there were some other subtractions. And like, okay, that could be interesting. Um, as long as the transaction, which is now overwritten, because I'm replaying the first one afterwards, and already have like the pre-calculated value. Um, as long as the first one was one million, 
um, dollars and the second one is just one hundred dollars. That's cool because my bank account will be better. Um, but in in general, um, as I said, for for everything that is basically writing to the database, not really changing something, it just doesn't matter, right? You just write it and write and write and and you're good to go. You only need to make sure you're not actually duplicating stuff here. Um, for example, if you're if you're in IoT and you have metric values or, or um, um, uh, can't come up with the name right now. But if you just have values and you write it to the database, you just want to make sure that you're not actually duplicating stuff. That is, it's brilliant. Um, for everything else, it's a little bit more complicated. It still works. So um, for, for, for developers, there's obviously a lot more stuff. Um, I don't think we need to talk about asynchronous, uh, asynchronicity, right? Asynchronous should be obvious. Um, I think we're not talking about other stuff like um, caching. Um, whenever something goes slow, like database and stuff, and we're not having like this hard feeling on, we definitely need the light, latest value, a cache is always a good thing. So there's a lot more stuff that can actually be done to make the application more resilient and, and faster in response time. Um, but it would, it would be, as I said, five hours at least. It could be even more. Um, and in, in, in terms of uh, caching, there, most of the time people come to me and like, well, I can't cache. I need the values the way they are. And yes, I understand that this is the general feeling that people have. Um, but do you really think that LinkedIn, um, YouTube, whatever uses hard consistency? No, they're not, right? You're uploading a video on YouTube, and you might see it right away. You might see it 10 seconds later. You might see it 15 seconds later. It just doesn't matter, right? As long as eventually everyone sees it, and for Twitter follow us, I'm not even sure it's eventual, um, because there's, there seems to be some loss and follow us all the time, which is interesting. Um, it's always the same people, though, right? So par partitioning of data is very obvious for Twitter. Um, as long as you have something which doesn't have to be immediately um, consistent, don't go for a relational database. As I said, tr all kinds of memory um, uh, money transactions Obviously, that's that's hard stuff, right? We we want to fix that, so we need to go for a relational database. Everything else, just put it somewhere else, and in the best case, in a cache. So the the second stage, operation DevOps, uh, whatever you're gonna call it, um, do load balancing. It doesn't matter if it's software, hardware, um, breadware, whatever. Um, in the worst case, you have some manual interaction and people are just shifting stuff, right? But the, the beauty of load balancing is it just doesn't matter where we deploy. It just doesn't matter how many instances we deploy. We can mix stuff. We can go for production and uh, bare metal, on-prem, cloud, uh, VMs, containers. It just doesn't matter. We can mix all of that. The load balancer takes care of re rerouting the traffic to the right position. And it's important because the load balancer is also uh, responsible for, oh, that one just crashed. So I'm not routing traffic to that anymore, right? So you have an immediate health check and you make sure that people hopefully, except for maybe a couple of seconds, milliseconds, something like that, um, will never be routed to a failing, failed, or broken instance, which is important because we want to have the users be happy, right? The worst thing that can happen to us is that we have to tell the user, hey, oh, you remember, we fucked up. We don't want that. We don't want this feeling. I don't want to be called by my colleagues. You don't want to be called by your colleagues. And in the middle of the night, hey, our service failed. We need you in the office right now. Right? And you remember, single point of failure. Goes for load balancers as well. Don't put a single load balancer. Don't put a single load balancer. Um, if you're running in the cloud, you, you're obviously not having a single one. It looks for you like a single service, but Amazon, Azure, Google, uh, whatever the cloud is, will make sure that it's not being a single instance. So um, no single point of failure, and that goes for everything. It means not a single instance of a service, not a single load balancer, not a single database. If you have a database which can't be sharded, well, sharding, oh, 
don't ask your database operators for sharding. They, they're going to hate you for that. Sharding is like the worst term for databases. Um, but um, if, if you can work with, as, as I said, non-like hard real-time, non-hard cons uh, consistent data, go for read-only um, uh, uh, secondaries or slaves, uh, whatever you're going to call them, right? If you have a relational database, just go through a secondary uh, read-only mirror. Um, writing only goes to this master server, but all the read operations, all the queries always go to multiple shards or multiple um, copies, mirrors of the, of the actual database. And it's beautiful because it's up to you to say, OK, I need another one because I'm having another 100 customers. So I need another instance of the mirror, and you're just mirroring through. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, if you have a database like Cassandra, like uh, MongoDB, wh whatever it is, um, they normally all support clusters. Have clusters, not single instances. And with clusters, I mean at least three nodes, better four, or whatever, and don't run them on a single machine. I've seen that. We had a customer at Hazelcast, and that was the best story ever. He was like, yeah, we're running a cluster of 20 Hazelcast nodes. OK, so how do you lay that out? Well, they're all running on the same uh, dedicated host. I'm like, what? Did you? I, I, think, I think there was some, some misunderstanding here. Uh, can, you, can you say that again? Right? It's like, that's, that's not resilient. Running a cluster on a single machine, if the single machine fails, um, obviously, it, it all will fail, right? So don't do that. Try to have one host or one cluster node per host or whatever you do. Um, obviously, it's not as easy on cl in, in, in cloud environments, but for at least Google and Azure, and uh, probably for AWS as well, you can tell, hey, I want at least, uh, I want a maximum, and if you're running Kubernetes, you can do this anyways. Um, I want a maximum of one node per Kubernetes node, one, no uh, one per physical host, whatever, right? Um, backups. Do I need to talk about backups? No, right? Who's doing backups? Who re OK, I, I think I can skip the second question. Who regularly replace backups, right? At least now all hands will be down, but that's all right. Um, backups are important. Do backups. Do it hourly. Do it daily. It doesn't matter. And try to replay backups in a, in a, in a regular interval. Right? You remember I said I can have a single command line, and it takes a backup. It replays it to a database. It spins up the cluster. That's beauty. That's a beautiful operation. Um, most of the time, it's just like people are like, yeah, yeah, we're doing backups. So when did you try it last time? And like, um, I, don't, I don't know. A year ago or so? Did it work? Um, I guess. Right? Um, don't, don't do that. Um, if, you, if you're running something um, like Postgres, or uh, Oracle database and stuff like that. They even have one amazing or one more amazing feature. It's point in time recovery. Point in time recovery gives you the option to actually set up a new instance, a new database at every single statement. So you just executed the delete from all. Yes, right. And then I was like, Ooh, well, it doesn't matter. Just replaying the database right before that. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't work if you uh, have an API that has some reaction on the other side, because your, your API user most probably can't do the same thing. Um, but at least for, for your own sake, uh, you should look into things like that. And as I said, I always try to re uh, restore backups just for the sake. OK, infrastructure and cloud, the third layer. And as I said, I, I on purpose removed management, because that's a problem in itself. That would be a whole different talk. Like, how do I convince management to be on board with developers? Right? But as I said before, uh, cloud and on-premise. Um, you can go either way. You can go both ways. With a load balancer in front, it just doesn't matter. Um, with an API gateway, it just doesn't matter. And for me, API gateway is just a fancy load balancer. <coughs> uh, never, I never said that. Uh, can, we, can we cut this? Um, so. Uh, so what we do is we're actually going both directions. So we have a couple of servers um, that are on-premise because we have to do a lot of calculations. And calculations are expensive if you're running in the cloud. So it was cheaper for us to just um, host free dedicated systems 
and say, okay, all the calculations are running there, but all the API handling and stuff is in the cloud. Uh, the only interesting fact with that, you should make sure that both systems are in the same environment, both in Google, both in whatever, because otherwise your, your, your major cost will be traffic. Um, most of the time, internal traffic is for free, but external is not. So yeah, uh, and, and obviously you can also go for, oh, not, not yet, okay, wrong slide. Anyways, um, uh, deploy into something which makes it easy to deploy, which makes it easy to replay the same thing. Kubernetes, as I said, it's, it's beautiful that by now we have the chance to be very close to what will be deployed in, the, in production on our local machines. We can use Minikube, we can use um, Minishift, I think, OpenShift, whatever. Um, you can use Cloud Foundry if you want to. And I'm sorry, Josh, but I'm not a big fan of Cloud Foundry. Um, but uh, it's, it's important to do that, right? Um, because it's, it, it makes things reliable. You can try it out and you understand, okay, it works or it doesn't work. That is the one that I was actually looking for. Um, do multi-region, right? Don't run in a single region. Um, Amazon calls it a, a availability zone. I think Azure calls it failover zone, whatever. Just make sure you're not running in a single thing. As I said, AWS, a whole region was offline. You definitely don't want to be in that region, at least not only. Uh, you think about using multiple clouds, right? Multiple clouds, maybe uh, Azure and AWS or Azure and, and Google Cloud. At least make sure that you can easily spin up a whole system or a fastly spin up a whole system when something fails, right? We want to make sure that uh, we're, actually, we're actually possible or it's actually possible for us to go somewhere else for money reasons, for, for time reasons, for latency reasons, whatever the reason is. And Kubernetes and, and Pivotal Cloud Foundry and stuff like that makes it easy because the underlying abstraction is the same thing. And if I say don't have a single system, uh, that goes all the way down to DNS. Who remembers when the half of the internet was offline because there was a major DDoS, what was it? Like 1.2 terabits per second DDoS against DIN DNS. It was beautiful. A couple of weeks later, Oracle actually bought DIN just to make sure that this is not gonna happen again. I mean, if, if that is what a DDoS gives your service, Oracle is buying you for a shitload of money, great. Uh, most of the time, it's probably not going to work, right? So um, go for two free DNS providers. It just doesn't matter. Make sure you're not relying on a single service here. And um, it's pretty much the last thing. Um, remember, we're always going for a trade-off. I said there's a lot of cool stuff. Go for communities. Go for Docker. Go for software-defined network. But always remember, there is a trade-off. You're adding abstraction for and, and complexity for convenience and for usability, right? And, and complexity and abstractions are nice as long as something, uh, as long as it works. The second something is failing, you have a problem. So obviously I could tell you Instana can help you with that. Um, well, that was the punchline. Um, but uh, we're, we're not here for that. So um, as I said, there's a couple of things a couple of blog posts, and I think you don't need to take a picture because it's probably going to be online, those slides, I guess. Perfect. So um, yeah, if the slides go online, as I said, there's a couple of blog posts, a couple of, of stuff that is all related to resiliency. If you love, follow that and, and, and read, uh, read up on that. So questions. I think we have three minutes left, something like that. Yeah, two minutes. N yeah. Um, okay, so the question is if I can elaborate why I think financial data belongs to a relational database and nothing else. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a hard problem, right? Be, the second money is involved with something, people want to make sure that their transaction goes through. Um, I, I worked for Ubisoft for a while and the actual user transactions, the money transaction were the only thing we saved into database, the, the in-game items that the users got, they, we didn't care about those because in the worst case, we could say, okay, here was the transaction, and yeah, the, the user account doesn't have the item which was related to this transaction. It's like, yeah, we're just giving it to you, right? Um, but you want to make at least sure that the transaction is around. 
because that is the point where you're like, okay, I understand, yes, there was a problem, and here's how we fix it. And give it, give, give the user two items. It doesn't matter, right? It, I mean, it's it's digital anyways. Does that answer the question? I know for banks that's not true. Um, <laughs> and uh, we love to think about bank transactions as like this consistent atomic operation, but it's 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 not true. And and if you hear stuff like uh, a German bank transferring 90% of its money with a PHP script on a Chrome job. Um, as I said, PHP had its use case. That was not one of those. Um, so from, from my perspective, you should definitely save those information in a database just for reliability reasons. Something else? I think we have one more minute. No, okay. Thank you.